So for those of you that are new to the church, my name's Chris, and uh, I am just the opening act for the main event, which is my wife. I definitely married up um, and so grateful for her. And we have four beautiful kids. We have four kids, Ethan, who's seven, Abigail, who's six, Joshua, who's four, Liam, who's one. Each one of the kids born in a different season. We have a kid for every season. Ethan was born in the fall, Abigail in the winter. They even went in order. How about that? Spring was Joshua and then summer was Liam. Each one of the kids, not only born in their own season, had their own story when they were born. Ethan, as he does, uh, creates the most work, and he put his poor mother through about 30 hours of labor. And then there was Abigail, and for those of you that don't know, we went to seminary. I went to seminary out in Denver, Colorado. We had our first two kids out in Denver, and Denver in December leads to snow. So Abigail was born in a blizzard, and I had to try and figure out in my Honda Civic how to navigate a blizzard with a very pregnant mommy. And then there's Joshua. Joshua was born in Jersey, so we had two Colorado babies. We got two Jersey babies. Joshua was born at Monmouth Medical Center in the Long Branch, and Joshua, interestingly enough, was easier than Ethan as far as delivery but that's very shocking and surprising because Joshua was nearly 10 and a half pounds when he was born. And my wife, my hero, didn't take any anesthetics at all. She didn't even take an aspirin and she gave birth to a nearly 10 and a half pound baby. So we thought to ourselves, oh boy, what will number four bring? So number four, Liam, our Liam Little Durkin, that's literally his name. Liam Little Durkin, middle name after Eric Little, missionary and uh, Olympian. He was born last August, August 2015. He was going to be born in the same hospital as his big brother Joshua, Mammoth Medical in Long Branch, right off of Route 36. Now, I know it's a long time ago, but do you remember we had a special visitor to Mammoth County and to Long Branch, and specifically the Mammoth Racetrack last August during the Haskell? There was a horse triple crown winner, named, remember, American Pharaoh. Do you remember this? So the time that my son was going to be born, we were like, Lord, please either bring him before the Haskell or after the Haskell, because we knew the Haskell was going to be a huge hassle, right? Because it was 60,000 people, 60,000 people. And by the way, Route 66, or Route uh, 36 gets crowded not with 60,000 people, with just 60 people. There's backed up traffic. You know, you're on the parkway pretty much. So I was thinking to myself, how am I going to get this pregnant mommy to this hospital? What's the route I'm going to take? Because many of us dads who are blessed with children, we know that the mommies, they do most of the work, right? They have to carry the baby, they nurture the baby, and then they deliver the baby. And all we got to do is get mommy and baby to the hospital, right? So for the way that I am, I, you know, I, I try to plan out and, and then map out every single uh, road, every single perceived hurdle. And then this horse decides <laughs> to show up when my baby's going to be born on the same exact day, on the same exact day. So what I had to do was to try and figure out a different route. What we're going to see in this text, it's not a horse that we're talking about, but ironically enough, yes, it's a pharaoh. American pharaoh, and now we're going back to the Egyptian pharaoh. And now we're not talking about a baby being born in Long Branch, we're talking about a nation being born in Israel. Israel began with a man Abraham, and then it grew into a family, and then a, and then a tribe, and then 12 tribes. And those 12 tribes, only of about 70 people, the Bible says, the book of Genesis says, multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied, and now they're probably about 2 million people. They are a massive nation without a land. They are a people that were promised land, but they're still in bondage. They're still in slavery. So it is very, very interesting in God's timing that he grew them and multiplied them, fulfilling the covenant he made with their forefather Abraham, not in Israel, but in Egypt. So now when we read this first verse, we're going to see after everything that we have walked through in Exodus, that now Pharaoh has finally released Israel. 
He has opened up his white knuckled grip. And God has so revealed his glory that even, yes, the cement heart, the hardened heart of Pharaoh has relented. We will see that Israel is going to walk through a very interesting path. It's not a path that any of us would choose on our own. It's not a path that you would even say is the easiest or even the most logical path. But because God leads them powerfully through a pillar of fire and a pillar of clouds, it is the best path for them. Let's look at the passage, shall we? Let's look at the passage. So we are in Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 17. The Bible says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war. And what does it say? If you take notes in your Bible, underline that, circle it, star it, lest they return to Egypt. Now, if you're uh, thinking about this passage, if you've been joining us as we've been walking through the book of Exodus, you remember the beginning of the story. It's been four centuries, 430 years to exact, to be exact, of slavery, no freedom, no national identity, no national borders, no land, not only no land, but oppressive work, oppressive labor, not only oppressive labor, but a tyrannical dictator who is trying to wipe out an entire generation is creating edicts that every single uh, Israelite baby born must be thrown into the Nile and now is trying to assimilate, was trying to assimilate Israel into Egypt so they would lose all their national identity and forget all of God's promises. So what, what did God do? We remember the story. We've been walking through it verse by verse. God revealed his mighty hand in signs and wonders, <clears throat> sometimes referred to as <clears throat> plagues. And those plagues, yes, they revealed his power over creation. Yes, those plagues gave Pharaoh an opportunity, in fact, nine opportunities, to turn, to relent. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to release Israel. Nine times with frogs, gnats, hail, boils, all kinds of different signs and wonders. But it led to last Sunday's study where God knew full well that the only way Pharaoh would let go, even though his people are suffering, even though his empire is crumbling, is that it had to hit home for Pharaoh. And the way that God decided to liberate his people from bondage was the Passover. So you remember from last week's study that every single Israelite home was commanded to sacrifice a lamb and then to cover their homes, their doorposts with the blood of the lamb. That when God's justice and his right wrath comes, pours through Egypt because they have been not only oppressive, to uh, Israel, but also that they have been worshiping these false pagan gods, that God's uh, wrath would pass over them because of the blood of the Lamb. Now this also foreshadows, as we remember, what? The final Passover. The forever sufficient Passover. And it wasn't, it wasn't with a lamb. It wasn't with many lambs. It was the Lamb of God. The lamb who would take away the sins of the world. And that lamb was a person. Not just any person, the Messiah. Not just the Messiah, but in fact, the Son of God and God the Son. God in our midst, the visible image of the invisible God. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bible says he's the exact representation of his being. Him, Jesus, offered himself on the cross so that whoever trusts not in their own morality, not in their own religion, not in their own good deeds, but in the final good deed, the final finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God's wrath passes over us, over them. This story has been playing itself out for centuries and eons. 
So it took all of that to get to the point where Pharaoh says, no, 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 no. His hardened heart led to an enslaved mind, and he refused to believe that what God said he would do, he would do. He kept trusting in all these other pagan Egyptian gods, and God revealed his power over these gods that he won't share his glory with another. So that comes to this point, this massive crossroads where Israel is about to be freed. And now what? Now what? Oh my goodness, we're liberated. Now we are free. What do we do? Where do we go? We don't know. So God knows. God knows exactly the path that he's going to lead them. Now through their own stubbornness and rebellion, it's going to be a longer path. But the path that God leads them is an interesting one. One scholar mentions this, that there is a way of the sea. There's a coastal highway called the Via Maris. Can anyone say Via Maris? It's like the Garden State Parkway, okay? So it's the Garden State Parkway. <clears throat> what you would do is you would take that, the Via Maris, from Egypt to the promised land, what we call now Israel, and it would only take about, listen to this, this is amazing, two weeks. Two weeks, 14 days. For those of you that know the story, know your Bible a little bit, how long is this generation wandering the wilderness and how long does it take them to get to the promised land? 40 years. Now you might think to yourself, God, why? This doesn't make any sense. Why would you have them go on a path for 40 years when they could just take the coastal highway, the Mediterranean Parkway, and get there. Yeah, there's some tolls, but you could get there in like two weeks. Well, he knew full well. He knew full well that when slaves are freed, that they have a hard time living in their freedom. That when slaves are freed, they're often afraid. When slaves are liberated, it is amazing and shocking how quickly they could go back to their bondage. And sure enough, that's what God knew. You see, there was Egyptian military outposts all along the, the uh, Via Maurice. Not only that, but the Philistines were there in encampments. And they had strong armies. They had heavy armor. They were an intimidating people. If these freed slaves saw the Egyptian outposts, if they saw the Philistines they would do what we think is impossible and unthinkable. What would they do? Turn around and go back. They would turn around and go back. Go back to Pharaoh. Go back to the evil dictator. Go back to the monarch. Go back to their slavery. Go back to their intensive labor. Go back to the violence. What? Sure enough, it happens later on. Numbers 14.4 all of Israel seems to cry out, quote, we should go back to Egypt. In fact, when Israel is wandering through the, the wilderness and they're getting a little hungry, they start to think and they get a little nostalgic. Man, didn't we have lots of meat back in Egypt? I remember eating like T-bone steaks every single night. Sometimes, sometimes freedom still comes with a cost. I heard one author put it this way, and I think he's right, that freedom is a tool to build with and not a toy to play with. That freedom is a tool to build with and not a toy to play with. Now, of course, this foreshadows our personal journey with Jesus, does it not? God has saved us, forgiven us, liberated us from what? Two masters, three masters, from sin and Satan, and eventually death. Sin is Satan. We are forgiven of our sin and broken of the bonds of slavery to Satan. So whereas before we would follow the ways of the prince of the air without even questioning it, now we understand he exists. Now we know that he's been deceiving us. And now because of our trust in the cross of Christ, we are free. As the book of Galatians says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Old Testament, New Testament, the same. Old Testament, New Testament, modern day, the same. Why? Because Christians, don't we, often return back to our slavery. Don't we? 
Don't we return back to our chains sometimes? Don't we start to believe, man, that wasn't so bad. Drinking every night, cursing, going out, not caring about people, not caring about God. I think I had it pretty good back then. No, you didn't. Slavery is slavery is slavery. Don't return back to it. So that's why, this is why we have to trust that God's faithful to lead us. That God has power to lead. Our own vision of the future is very finite, is it not? So you might think to yourself, well, God, why are you taking me on this long journey through the wilderness, this long journey through the valley? Man, when I could see it, it's like two weeks ahead of me. I could get there. You know, I might break a couple traffic laws to get there, but I could get there. God, why are you taking me this way? This is shorter. I'll take the turnpike, right? Do we not do the same thing? Because the truth is, is that even though it would have took two weeks without any kind of hindrance or hurdle, God knew this. God knew that Israel would start out on that coastal highway and what should have been two weeks when they returned back to Egypt, returned back to their slavery, would actually become two centuries. They would be returning back to their bonds, back to their bondage. God knew this. And that's why some of us, we struggle when we're in the valley, when we're in the wilderness, right? You guys all know Psalm 23. We're going to end our time today with Psalm 23. In the beginning, when the Lord is our shepherd, man, when he's our shepherd and we're close and we're just sheep following the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, we're so consumed and in love with him, we shall not want. There's no, nothing that we want. And then we go through, yes, green pastures, yes, paths of righteousness, but then there's that valley, that valley of the shadow of death. And we wonder if the same shepherd who led us at the beginning to the point where we weren't desiring and craving anything but him and then will lead us to the end where our cup overflows as he's still with us in the valley. Is he still present? Is he still leading? Is he still guiding? Does he still care? I heard of a uh, second grader. Second grader who was in a Sunday school class. A second grader who was commissioned by his Sunday school teacher to memorize all of Psalm 23. All of Psalm 23. And what they were going to do at some kind of church celebration, maybe a fall kickoff just like ours, is that the students that were memorizing Scripture would get before the church and stand before a microphone, and they would recite the Scripture that they were uh, asked to memorize. So this young boy, seven, eight years old, was trying to memorize Psalm 23. And he was very excited about it. He tried real hard. He worked real hard, but he just couldn't get past that first verse. Nothing else in Psalm 23 would stick. So he tried, he tried, he tried, and then the big day came, and then the moment came, and he walks up to the microphone, if you can imagine, and all these big, intimidating, scary adults are looking at him, and he says this, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all that I need to know. And then he walks away and returns back to his chair. All right, all right. Of course, every single part of Psalm 23 is important, beautiful, and should be celebrated and received, believed, put in practice. But there's something right about that too. The Lord is my shepherd. That's all I need to know. He's faithful in the good times and present in the bad. Let's keep reading, shall we? So God's going to take them along this longer route, verse 18, but God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. He's leading them, by the way, to a, a body of water with no bridge, no boats. This doesn't make any sense, God. God's about to do immeasurably more than they think or could possibly imagine, as Ephesians 3 says. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. 
So it's as if in perfect timing, in a perfect place, where they're wondering, God, where are you taking us? You're leading us to the Red Sea. Shouldn't we take the, the Via Marie? Shouldn't we take the coastal highway? What do they have a living reminder of? In fact, that living reminder had long since died. It's Joseph. It's Joseph. Joseph was the one, if you remember from our study in Genesis, who God shows who he would rise above his brothers and sisters, above his parents to a place of prestige and influence. And Joseph, as a young man, thought that was going to be a quick, easy journey. And then what happened, church? Many, many years of betrayal by his brothers and then spent as a slave and then accused by his boss's wife and then sent to a dungeon. And then he interprets a dream, but then is forgotten by those who serve the Pharaoh. All of that trial and difficulty, down, 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 down. What was amazing about Joseph is he never seemed to doubt God's faithfulness. He was given a dream, and it didn't go as he thought. But, you remember the story? God was working all of this for his glory and our good. To do what? To protect his family. To provide for his family in one of the worst famines in the ancient Near East. So Joseph didn't understand it, but he still trusted. He still obeyed, even though he was a slave, even though he was accused, even though he was betrayed, even though he was forgotten. You know what was the biggest example of Joseph's trust of God's faithfulness? What you just heard. What you just heard. Nothing in the book of Exodus or in Genesis, but here in the book of Exodus. Joseph knew full well that after reconciling with his brother, after reconciling with his father, and all of this beautiful grace erupting in his family with tears and hugs and God protecting uh, Israel and protecting his people, he did make a promise at the end of Genesis. What? God will visit you. This, even though, is God's tool to save you now. It's not your permanent home. God's going to visit you and then take you to your own land where you can worship freely, where you can have your own borders, your own identity, and you can serve the Lord. This might be the greatest example of Joseph's faithfulness, his trust that God is powerful to lead. Now listen, how long between Joseph's dream and when that dream was fulfilled? Many, many years. How long between Joseph's promise, Joseph's request at the end of Genesis, and now here in Exodus? Many, many more years, right? So even as they are marching out and they're afraid and they're wondering, God, is this the right way we should go? Is this the right path? Here it is, Joseph. Oh, right, right. This is how you saved our forefathers. This is how you saved uh, Jacob and his whole family. Right, here we go. Okay, Joseph, here we go. We remember now God's going to be faithful even though none of this makes sense. And then he gives them, if that wasn't enough, a dramatic supernatural example of his presence and his power. Let's keep reading, shall we? And we'll close with this. I'm in verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, what does it say, church? Did not depart from before the people. Here's what's so interesting about this. I put up a picture here. Now, this is just a painting of it, right? But it gives you a little bit of an understanding of how big and majestic this must have seen. This was a powerful reminder of God's presence, but it was also a proclamation as they were going out into foreign hostile lands. Remember, they were armed for battle. They were going out and God was going to lead the way. Now, this is amazing. You ready for this? Your Bible is altogether 100% amazing. Last Sunday, we talked about the Passover, God's forgiveness and grace, his justice, passing his judgment, passing over his people. And now he gives them what? A fire. You know what? The prophet Isaiah actually describes in Isaiah 63, 11 through 14, describes all of this as the Holy Spirit of God leading his people. So in the same way that God delivered and forgave uh, Israel 
and passed over them. He's now leading them by the Holy Spirit through an example of fire. Does that remind you of something else? Does that remind you of something else? When the final Passover happened and Jesus died on the cross for us so we could be forgiven forever, that no more lambs need to be sacrificed, no more Passovers needed to be celebrated, we don't eat of the bitter herbs of our slavery anymore, right? Now and forever we are forgiven what happens in the book of Acts. It's not a pillar of fire to lead his people. Tongues. Tongues of fire. Now you're, some of your words are like, oh, 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 where's this going? He said tongues. Meaning simply this, at least for now, right now, is that our God is a consuming fire, right? And he revealed his presence then in Egypt, and he's revealing his presence now with the church. And it's not through a demonstration of a pillar of fire uh, in their midst. It's actually the fire of God, the spirit of God in their hearts, guiding them. And some of us, we have big questions going on right now. Man, should I do this thing or should I take this job or should I go to this school or should I hang out with this person or should I not hang out with this person or should I break off this friendship or relationship? And some of us, man, we think to ourselves, God, it would be awesome to have a pillar of fire leading the way. Have you ever thought about that? How impractical that would be? If God did show up with a pillar of fire, led you to the job you're supposed to be at, and you're walking into your cubicle with a big pillar of fire out in, the, out in the driveway, you know what he gave you? Something even better. The Holy Spirit of God in you, reminding you of his presence and pointing you to the word of God. Many of People will come to me as a pastor, as they often do, and say, you know, pastor, I just, I, I'm not sure which way to go. It doesn't feel like God's directing me. It doesn't feel like God's speaking to me. It's not revealing anything to me. And then I just ask the simple question, is this ever open? Do we ever read the Bible inspired by the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that brought the pillar of fire? Well, uh, no. I mean, I read at church when I'm with you which I'm really glad and excited for. But if our relationship with God is completely one way, where we're always saying, where God, where God, where God, and he is speaking right here in his word. We're always saying, should I do this or should I do that? And we're sometimes not just asking, we are crying out, yes, even with bitterness, why God? That's why it's so important to come to this. You remember how they were armed for battle? It's not by accident that in Ephesians chapter 6, the early church was called to take up the full armor of God, right? The Holy Spirit, yes, gives his presence, empowers his people for ministry, but also protects them for battle. And there's one offensive weapon, and it's this one, the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, right? Right? So as we were saved, as we were forgiven, Many of us, we still have a hard time coming to grips with the fact that there is an enemy of our soul, that he prowls around us like a lion. Not the unbelieving world. Christians forget this. And that's why, yes, enjoy the good times of life, but never think that life in this world is a playground. No, church, it's a battleground. It really is. New York last night, Point Pleasant yesterday. That's bombs and explosions in our backyards. But Lord knows, I got bombs and explosions in my heart all the time, in my mind all the time. Man, I need to know that God is powerful and faithful to lead. That's why the Spirit of God will always point us to the Word of God, which points us to the Son of God, so we could be part of the mission of God. What I'd love to do right now is to read the entire psalm, one of the most cher cherished, rightfully so, passages in all of Scripture, Psalm 23. And for those of us that perhaps we are by those green pastures and everything's all right, not bad, we still are called to be close to the Good Shepherd. For those of us who are in the valley, we are called to remember that the Good Shepherd is with us. I was so convicted last week about remembering the Passover, remembering the Lord's sacrifice, that I felt led to say, all right, well, let's do this up until our new sermon series on the Ten Commandments starting in three weeks. 
So we're going to keep coming to the table because we tend to forget the price that Jesus paid and also forget our new identity as new creations, as born-again saints because of Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. I hope and I pray that you see it with new, fresh eyes this morning. And he encourages you as not only creator, but as good shepherd. The Bible says this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.